Book 4, Falcon in the Barn, Chapter 38. My name is Shem Zenus, and Shem entered the dark barn as slowly as he approached it. While the trip to Deck's place usually took only a few minutes, Shem wasn't about to take any chances, not at this point to the plan. He'd circled the area for an hour under cover of a very dark night. Not even the cow seemed to hear his footsteps. He stepped into the middle of the barn, slowly removed the bag from his shoulder, and placed it on the ground. Carefully, he lit the small candle he brought and looked around. Perrin? Shem knew he was there, even though he didn't respond. Thicker than the scent to manure was the tension that filled the barn. This wasn't going to be easy. Can I just start by saying this wasn't how it was going to be? It was supposed to be me telling you. And I've had speeches and thoughts prepared for years. Shem sighed sadly. I can't imagine what you think of me. And, and let me add that I completely understand if you're feeling a bit paranoid right now. Who are you? Honestly. The cold voice interrupted from somewhere above. Shem looked up into the rafters and cleared his throat. My name is Shem Zenas. I was born in Salem. My mother died when I was two. I have a father and a sister who is 10 years older than me. And he hesitated. When you're used to expressing one form of truth, finally admitting the real one tends to catch in your throat. But he'd been waiting for 17 years to do this. She's not my only sister. My father waited through five more daughters before he finally got his son. I do have two nieces, as I told you, and 29 more nieces and nephews, not counting Jaitsi and Pato, and many great nieces and nephews. The count changes every season. I really did have more experience watching your children when they were young than you did. Keep going, the voice said grimly. Shem nodded. It felt wrong to be confessing, especially this way. But it was only fair that he experienced the same vulnerability as his best friend. I, I, I've never been to Flax or Waves, he began his ramble. I took those names off the map in your office the first day I met you. The first time I rode south was when I was trying to catch up to you on the way to Idumea. Remember that garter spy in the forest the first year that I was feeding and getting information from? Well, there was no spy. I was just trying to find a way to earn your confidence and find excuses to come to your home. I was inexperienced and clumsy back then and made a lot of mistakes, which he felt he was doing again but there was no sense in holding back anymore. I was initially supposed to stay only two years to learn about you and to discover if we could work around you, but I found more an edge than I expected. He took an earnest step forward. Perrin, I was never dishonest in my feelings toward you or your family. Yours is my second family, and I've never done anything to jeopardize you. Perrin's tone could have frozen a fire. Anything else? I, I have some records in this bag that... Anything else personal? Shem looked up and around, trying to find the location of the voice. He saw a glint of steel in the faint light cast off by his candle. Personal. All right, the truth of everything. That's what I'm here to give you. He meant to follow that up with a tense chuckle, but it stuck in his throat. After a nervous cough, he said, Here we go. Well, Perrin, you always make me nervous when you hold that knife of yours, because no one ever seems to survive an encounter with your blades. I never cheated in the strongest soldier races, but I was tempted. I had a big crush on Murray when I was 21, but I got over that when I realized it could never be. I once tried on your jacket when you were lieutenant colonel. I loved sitting in your big chair and practicing your come in voice when you were away. Fooled Thorn with it more than one occasion. And Perrin, I swore I'd never tell you this, but you really should know. 
I've kept this in confidence for quite a while, but he took a deep breath. Perrin, I find the way you say no, no, no irritating. One no is sufficient, really. Why three times? I never understood that. Then he braced for the impact. A dark chuckle came from behind the glint of steel. You really had a crush on her. Most miserable weeks of my life, Shem sighed heavily. Knew I had to get over it the night of that garter attack when she thought I was unconscious and held my hand, called me her little brother, and told me the story of how she fell in love with you. I knew then it'd always be you. The rafters were silent. Shem fought the desire to clench his fist in defense. Whatever would come, he would take. How did my jacket look on you? Quite handsome, Shem dared a small smile. Should have been mine. Silence. I say no three times because I want to make sure people hear it. Shem scoffed in a way he hoped sounded good-natured. You really think people don't hear you? Once really is enough. You are being completely honest with me tonight. Shem knew this was going to be a rough ride. He had always pictured some scenario where he'd be sitting in the Shin's gathering room. I would say something like, about those garters, there are a few things you don't know. He was going to relish the look of absolute astonishment at each of the Shin's faces once he told them after all these years. But in his mind, the grand disclosure never involved Dark Barnes or his best friend holding a long knife with Shem as the target. Perrin, I think confessing to someone that I had feelings for his wife is about as honest as one man can be with another. A body dropped out of the rafters right in front of Shem. All he saw was a flash of steel as its cold tip pressed into his throat and a strong arm wrapped around his torso, restricting his arms. The candle in Shem's hand snuffed out. He sucked in his breath at the touch of the blade, but he didn't take a defensive stance. Instead, he remained at the mercy of Perrin. So tell me this. Perrin's voice was low and harsh. Was I the biggest fool in the entire army that you could march hundreds of people past my fort without my notice. You were never a fool, Perrin. The steadiness of his voice surprised Shem, almost as much as the knife. Quite the opposite. You were the only one we could trust. The Creator placed you there so you could be the means of saving thousands of people. Perrin, just put the knife away, please. I promise I'll tell you everything. I went to Edge because I chose to, not because I was sent there. Perrin's tone was thick with paranoia. You told me once you felt drawn to Edge, Shem reminded him. Why do you think that is? When Perrin didn't answer, Shem said, The Creator put that desire in you, and you listened to him, as you should. Hogel wanted me to come back. He kept writing me. Perrin gasped as a new idea came to him. Shem, your contact told me that the rectors in the world were from Salem. Was Hogel? No, you know, he wasn't. We had only two or three from Salem at the time of Hogel. But Perrin, Hogel knew about us. Perrin pulled the knife back a little. Are you sure? Shem nodded before realizing Perrin wouldn't be able to see him in the dark. Just a few days before that first garter raid, he took me to his office after the Holy Day luncheon. He said, I know who you are and why you're in Edge. Maybe he thought you were a garter. No, Perrin, because then he said, I've done all I could to prepare Perrin for the Creator. Prepare me? Perrin's tone was now doubtful and confused, with a healthy dose of cynicism. Shem knew it was going to be a long night, and the knife still hovering near his throat wasn't helping things. He told me that the Creator had revealed to him who you were to become, he explained. 
that was back when you were still a teenager. So he invited you to Edge and said that you grew a great deal in that time. I came to Edge for weeding season when I was 18, Perrin murmured. Hogel changed the way I thought about everything. He fixed everything in me, too, he added. He and Tabit always wanted me to come back. So I did when I was a captain. The Creator has all kinds of ways of nudging people in the right directions, Shem said gently, sensing that Perrin's cynicism was fading. Hogel told me he thoroughly enjoyed the last few years he had with you, but he was getting too old to keep up anymore. He told me to watch out for you and that you were now my responsibility. Perrin was quiet before saying, Hogel knew he'd be dying? Yes, I'm sure he did. Rather a lot for a 21-year-old to hear, I have to admit, Shem chuckled sadly. Remember, I was struggling with that crush on Mari at the time, too. I think I just stared at him for a full minute before he slapped me on the back, waggled those eyebrows of his, and wished me good luck. Behind him, Shem felt Perrin scoff lightly. A oh, Hogel. He told Mari and me to keep you close. We thought it was because he liked you. Sometimes I think I learned so much from him, but I suppose he kept far more from me than I realized. I'm beginning to realize that everyone has been keeping things from me. I may have to interrogate Mari later just to see what else she knows that I don't. Shem didn't say a word and didn't move a muscle, but stood as sedately as he could. She was in the forest many years ago, Perrin said. Met Young's wife. Did you know that? Shem swallowed. Actually, I did. Figures. Perrin scoffed again. I've been thinking. Those two lieutenants who were found dead in the front to the guest quarters where my parents were staying after that garter raid? Tell me the truth. They didn't die fighting each other all those years ago, did they? Shem looked down guiltily at his hands as if he could see them in the dark. No, they didn't. They were about to kill your parents. I knew it wasn't their time to go, so I, I redirected their hands. The lieutenants killed themselves with my guidance. Perrin let out a low whistle. We suspected you. I know you did. Your father's interrogation is rather hard to forget, and it made me sick to do it. Of course it did. Interesting cover, too, getting sick like that. I promise that wasn't faked. The men chuckled quietly. Shem sighed in relief to hear the old parents softening. If only he'd sheathed that long knife. And Perrin, the one called Hef, his real name was actually Son of Orin. Perrin sucked in his breath. Are, are you sure? Orin's oldest son? Oh, I'm sure. He was there to kill your father and take back the mansion he grew up in. How did you know? Perrin whispered. How much contact did you have with the garters? I was never in contact with them. That's the truth. It would have been too dangerous. But how I knew about the lieutenants? I was guided by the creator, Shem explained. Whenever I saw someone that shouldn't be where he was, I saw plainly in my mind what I had to do to move them away. That night in the hallway, when I saw the two lieutenants plotting to burst into the guest quarters, the image of my killing them came clearly to my mind. They couldn't be allowed to destroy Ralph and Joriana, not before their time. They still had to rescue Edge years later. It was my duty to destroy two evil men to keep them from disrupting the Creator's work. Perrin, I still don't believe I did it. I felt a force pushing me and directing my hand. It took only seconds and I really wasn't that skilled. And in the end, I had only one drop of blood on me. A drop that your father wiped off my chin. And here I've been saying all these years that you could never kill anything. Perrin chuckled darkly. 
It wasn't really me, Perrin. I was just the instrument. And it was awful. Were there any others? Shem nodded guiltily. That year, at the end of raining season, I was on patrol along the forest with three other soldiers when I received a signal that help was needed in the forest. A signal? How? Something similar to our coded messages to each other. Tweaked a bit. Salemite scouts always hide in the trees above the fresh spring in case I need to drop a message to them. A quick glance was all we needed. That night, the message was that they required help in the forest. I faked an illness, told the soldiers on patrol that I wouldn't be able to make it back to the fort before I needed to change my trousers, and asked them to do a few circuits without me while I stayed at the fresh spring. They agreed to leave you? Perrin exclaimed. At the fresh spring alone? And at night. They really didn't think anything of it. I'm not sure if you remember, but the entire fort was out that night, looking for a strange noise gallivanting in the forest. And I always thought I had everyone trained so well. Never leave a man alone. Always look up into the trees. You did, Perrin, I promise, Shem chuckled. A noise in the forest? Shem heard Perrin scratch his stubbly chin with his knife hand. We didn't find out what it was, did we? Shem shook his head. No, you didn't. And for that, I owe you an apology. Perrin, it was my fault. This night's just going to get longer, isn't it? My fault because I trained Barker. Wait, my dog Barker? The dog that never barked? Yep. I come by late at night and train him to follow me, to leave my side running, then return when I made a noise like a crow cawing or a squirrel chirping. In those early years, we used him to throw garters off our trails. They'd go running after him, leaving alone the expecting mothers and the families we were trying to move. Barker blended into the forest, made a lot of noise, but never barked. That's because his parents and grandparents didn't bark either. Do you remember how you got that dog? He was found near a canal, abandoned. Or so I told you. Now that I think about it, Shem, you're the one who brought me that puppy. All the way from Salem. Not all of those dogs are silent. Barker was the only one of that litter who appeared to not bark. And I knew you wanted a dog, we needed an animal to use as a diversion. It just all worked out. Amazing, Perrin breathed. My dog was a Salemite. The cat's not from Salem, is he? No, he's not, Shem chuckled. So tell me about that third life you ended, Perrin reminded him. Shem sighed. Once the soldiers left me at the fresh spring, I headed up into the forest and received word that four garters had ventured far past our defenses. We always had about a dozen men in those days sitting in the forest, watching and encouraging the garters to go in other directions away from our route. But that night, we were bringing out a large group. Three expecting women, their husbands, six children, and one grandparent. Thirteen, not including the escorts helping them. Everything was going well until they made it into the forest. That's when one of the expecting women felt her waters break and gush. She didn't, right? Perrin must have been cringing. Didn't birth in the forest? She did. We have ways to deal with that, but usually we try to get them to a secure location first. Well, this baby wasn't about to wait. They had no choice but to stop and help her birth. It was the noise that attracted the garter's attention. Perrin shuddered behind Shem. Oh, I was always pacing the fields when Mari birthed, but I can imagine the noises. It wasn't the mother, but her children. They were so frightened of the forest, of what was happening with their mother. It was all too much for them. 
They started wailing. Despite everyone's reassurances, they'd soon be a big brother and a big sister. Did the garters find them? Almost. That's what I was dispatched for. We were short on scouts because several ran to help the families calm down the children. Three different groups of four garters each were headed in their direction. Our men were able to take care of two groups, but my contact at the Fresh Spring told me to lure the last group to a trap of nets and ropes we'd established, just in case of a situation like this. So I found them, killed one of them, which made the other three follow me, and I led them straight to the trap. Shem took it as a good sign that Perrin's arm holding the knife had been dropping. Still, Shem wasn't about to move. How did you kill him, Shem? Long knife, heart. Perrin let out another low whistle. Oh, I remember you saying you lost it and never wanted to own another one again. You said it was too deadly a weapon. Shem sighed. It was. I never carried another one until Thorn. Amazing, Perrin whispered. So the families got away? Shem smiled. Yep. They went into the forest with 13, came out with 14. And that baby's a strapping teenager now who wants to be a scout when he's old enough. His parents named him Woodson, son born in the woods. I feel I hardly know you, Shem, Perrin said, his tone full of astonishment. So much you've been doing, had been doing, my whole image of you has changed. I'm sorry, Shem whispered. Not entirely for the worse, I promise, Perrin assured him. In fact, you have me just a little wary of you. And all this time, I thought Moreland was your first deaths. There were a few others in the forests over the years, Shem winced. Sorry again, four more. And Perrin, that night the baby was born in the forest, was also the night Mari ran into Mrs. Young, who scared her back again. Perrin sighed. Ah, she told me about that. And that she also ran into Barker. Oh, I see. You sent Barker to her, didn't you? I just, I just, he exhaled loudly. You know, Shem, you've had 17 years to tell me everything, anything, something, and yet you didn't. Why did I have to hear it all from strangers? So many times you could have told me who you really were and why you were really here. When we sat in Idumea and slept in that barn, when we spent all those long nights at my table when I didn't know what was real and what was nightmare, the truth could have made a difference. But not once. Why? Anguished, Shem said, Perrin, so often I wanted to tell you what I knew, what I thought you should know, but usually the time never seemed right. There were moments where I could see an opportunity to give you a few hints, but I was afraid. Then again, had I told you what I knew, you may have become even more unstable. Unstable? Think about it, Perrin, Shem said patiently. A couple of years ago, you were so paranoid, you even thought Deckett's parents were spies. And more than once, I saw you look under your desk before you sat behind it. You really think I should have told you then that I was a plant for a people you didn't even know existed? Perrin was silent for a full minute before he said, you may have a point. That kind of news would have also made you vulnerable to the real garters. Honestly, Perrin, how would you have responded to learning that there were two groups in the forests? Perrin exhaled heavily in response. Each time I wanted to open my mouth, the Creator shut it. It wasn't that I didn't trust you, Perrin. It was that you wouldn't have been able to continue what you were doing, knowing all that we know. I am sorry. I'd been planning for years to be the one to visit you tonight but I couldn't get out of the fort until now. We were running out of time, 
and when my contacts didn't hear from me, they decided to reach you first. I practiced my speech to you and Mari for years now. Guess I'll have to save it for another day. Perrin's shoulders sagged, and he let the knife drop to his side, still clenched. In resignation, he released his grip on Shem, and Shem turned to face Perrin in the darkness. I don't know what to believe or trust anymore, Perrin admitted. My wife's ready to follow anyone into the forest, and in the morning we're to tell Jaitsi, Deckett, and Pato. Tell them what? Shem, do I really know who you are now? Yes, you do, Shem said earnestly. I haven't changed. I've always been your brother. Now, with a few more details, he admitted. Perrin slowly put the knife back into his waistband, to Shem's great relief. Yes, you've been my brother. A deceitful, sneaky, lying brother, but I suppose that's the way most brothers are. Shem chuckled, and he could just make out Perrin's smile in the dimness. Uh, something else you should know. My contact said he told you that I was the only Salemite you ever knew, along with Rector Young, but that wasn't correct. Perrin sighed and motioned with his hand. Let me have it. Besides me, Rector Young, and Mrs. Brax Hicks, the midwife, there was Benef. Sergeant Major Benef? Perrin nearly forgot to keep his voice down. Shem nodded. He went to Idamea when he was in his early 20s, just like me. He was to join with the garrison and learn about the army. Perrin nodded. He'd always been around, transferring from fort to fort. My grandfather even knew him. You must have been happy to see him come to Edge then. No, no, I wasn't, Shem exclaimed. Ben F. didn't do so well out on his own. He soon got caught up with the wrong people. After the first year, he was no longer sending messages back to Salem. A couple of years later, one of our scouts found him. Perrin, Ben F. joined the garters. He was one of the first insiders. What? Perrin blurted. Oh, come on, Benef? Doddering, theater-going, never-shut-up Benef? Shem smiled at his friend's consternation. He was never very effective, ho-ho. Fortunately, he didn't really help their side or ours. He just kind of was. Wait a minute. No, he wasn't from Salem, Perrin remembered. He said he had a family. What was it? A brother and sister-in-law that dragged him to the theater? Shem shrugged. I tell people I have a brother and sister-in-law in Edge. Perrin sighed. I am assuming you know what happened to him at the offensive. Some of our men found him on his way to Moreland, but he got lost in the woods. In his pocket was a note telling them to expect an attack at dawn. Stupid old man, Perrin hissed. He never made it to Moreland. He paid for his treachery with his life, Perrin. I was lost in those woods looking for him when you called for the early beginning of the offensive. You could have told me, you know, I nearly missed it. I thought you were answering the call of nature somewhere. I wasn't about to hold up everything just for you, Perrin snapped. But Shem heard a hint of Perrin's humor returning. That's what I had called the meeting for, the one you left prematurely, to announce that early strike. Shem smiled apologetically. It turned out all right in the end, didn't it? Show me what's in the bag, Perrin said. They took Shem's leather bag into an inner stall where no lantern light would escape through the cracks after Shem let out the nervous cow first. Shem pulled out detailed records with names and dates of people who left via Shem's route over the years. I don't usually keep these records in my quarters. I made a box some years ago with a stone cover and buried it in the forest. Salemites know where it is, but garters just pass it, thinking it's a regular rock on the ground. I brought the records out for you to see, thinking you might want some evidence. This quiet period here, 
He gestured to a page of notes. That's when we shifted the route to moorland. It was easier for a time because the ground wasn't as active. The land in the forests here seems to cycle every few years. Steam vents and gases become very active for about five seasons, then quiet again. But after the land tremor, nothing was predictable. We still run into surprises in the forests. Perrin shook his head as he gazed at page after page of Shem's neat handwriting, augmented occasionally by others leaving messages and updates. How did you do it? How did you get people out without any of our soldiers noticing? Who has scheduled all of the training for the past 15 years? Perrin smiled faintly. I wondered why you were so eager to do the scheduling job no one else wanted, and why you didn't want Thorn taking it over. Exactly. We used Barker the distractor at the beginning, but once I was put in charge of scheduling, I knew when groups were leaving, so I scheduled training, drills, and everything else as far away as possible. Parents studied the pages. Where's the route, Shem? He tossed out casually. But Shem heard the old undertones of paranoia. I can't tell you. Come on, Shem, it's me. That's exactly why, Shem sighed. Perrin, we haven't always been successful. A few times, we've been caught. Not everyone in the army follows the guidelines. Perrin looked up from the pages. What do you mean? A few years ago, one group was captured by the army outside of pools. The mother was very large with her third child, and she was struggling. They were taken to Idemia and questioned. Shem hesitated. Yes, Perrin said intently. Go on. Shem sighed. The, the father didn't survive the questioning. Neither did two of our escorts. A grandfather was released when it was finally believed he really didn't know where they were going. He found one of our scouts and told him what happened. The less you know, the easier it may be if we aren't successful. We never knew what happened to the mother and her two children. Perrin leaned forward, furious. We don't question to death, Shem. Who did it? You need only one guess. Perrin sagged into the straw. Cain Thorn. Perrin, he's one of them. Closing his eyes, Perrin whispered, Lemuel? Oddly, not quite, Shem shrugged. I, I don't know the details, but he's not old enough or advanced enough or something like that. But we know there are certain tests he has to pass and goals he has to achieve. He has to earn the position of being a garter in command like Kayan. All he knows so far is that his father is part of a secret organization. I don't think he even realizes that it's the garters or that his father has had a hand in directing some of their activities. We're not even sure General Thorne knows everything. Perrin groaned quietly, massaging his eyes. Only one man seems to hold all the knowledge, Shem continued. And despite all the scouts we have serving in forts and Idemia and hiding in trees, listening to passing garter conversations, we've never been able to pinpoint who that is. But because of the way that he's been able to influence activity all these years, we're fairly confident it's an administrator. Perrin sighed. I'm willing to bet it is Mal. That's my guess as well. And Perrin, Shem added, Lemuel thinks I'm part of it too. That's the only reason he's tolerated me. He thinks you're a garter? Perrin rocked back. Remember when we went to Idemia, the carriage ride we took to the hospital? Thorn and Cush questioned me. Perrin scowled. I heard it. I don't recall you saying, hey, by the way, I'm a garter. I didn't have to. I knew the code words. Code words? Shem nodded. Remember back about 13 years ago when we were sitting in the trees and rocks all night, practicing our facial codes and 
watching Garter spy on the fort? Remember that one who was alone and disoriented and thought I was his contact? Yes. Fortunate time for you to have to answer the call of nature again. That's the one I took care of, right? Shem winced and nodded. Yeah. You dropped down out of the tree, slashed his throat. That was a real mess. Perrin rolled his hand. Get to your point. When he was talking to me, he suddenly became nervous. He said, I've always found the North appealing. I didn't know what to do with that. So I said, really interesting. Then he said it again more urgently. I've always found the North appealing. That's when I realized the phrase meant something. He seemed to be waiting for a response, but all I could think to say was, but it's cold up here. Well, that was the wrong thing to say. That's when he got nervous, and that's when you put stains on my jacket. And saved your life, you're welcome. Shem chuckled. <laughs> Only later did I remember those two lieutenants, son of Oren and the other one, who came as your father's guard after the raid on Edge. One asked if I found the North appealing. I was so surprised by the oddness of that question that I didn't respond for a minute. Then, years later in Idumea, I remembered that again, when Thorn and Cush were asking me about my background in the coach. I assumed that's what they were trying to find out, if I might not be a garter and one that they had been wondering about. Perrin cocked his head. Wondering about? Shem, he said slowly. Exactly what else have you been doing all these years? Shem squirmed. In the early years, a couple of our scouts contacted the real garters and sent them messages that the fort and edge had a quiet garter serving in your fort to keep you in the game. To keep from blowing his cover, the quiet man would never make contact with the body of garters unless necessary. So you're the quiet man, Perrin guessed. That's me. The hope was that if the garters suspected a man was already on the inside, they wouldn't send anyone else to annoy you. I don't know if you remember, but right after I signed on officially, there was another soldier who signed up too. Nervous, skittish slip of a boy. Perrin frowned, trying to remember. He didn't stay, right? That's right. I took him to the forest where several Salem scouts abducted him. Perrin's eyebrows shot upwards. Perrin, he was a garter, sent to get close to you so he could feed information back to the garters. You were to take him under your wing, help him along, become his best buddy. But you already took that role, didn't you? Perrin smirked. Shem grinned. Yep. There were a few more men sent by the garters over the years to infiltrate the fort. Our scouts in the forests would recognize increased activity in the trees when someone was to be sent. It seems the garters watched for several days after a new arrival to make sure their inside man didn't need any assistance. So the Salemite scouts would send me word to watch for a new soldier who might be more than just a soldier. I'd watch who came in and wait until I got a feeling about someone. Then I lured them out to the trees where they would inevitably confess their identity and earn them an unexpected trip to Salem. We didn't want anyone to get close to you, besides me. Amazing. Perrin sat back and stared at his friend. You've used that word a lot tonight. So, when you and I got to Idumea, Shem picked up the story again, and I found myself in the coach with Kay and Thorn, who we already suspected was high up in the garter leadership, I realized he might try to figure out who I was. It would also allow me to verify our suspicions about him. If he knew the codes, It'd only be because he was a garter. If he thought you were already under the watch of a garter, they might leave you alone. Perrin smiled slightly. And they did, with you by my side. See? Shem beamed. It worked!
When Thorn and Cush suggested that most people don't like the North, I knew what to answer. I find the North appealing. The correct response to that phrase, it seems, is no verbal response, but a smile. Both of them smiled at me, just like the two lieutenants smiled at me years ago after I paused for a few moments before answering them. Perrin leaned back against the wall in dismay. Cush? Cush was one of them? My father trusted him with everything. Shem shook his head. Cush wasn't one of them, but he knew about them. As far as we could tell, he tried to play both sides. He was devoted to your father, Perrin, but he was also frightened of his son-in-law. I suspected the only reason Cain married Versala was to have access to the high general position. And I'm convinced Lemuel was sent here to secure Jaitsi for the same reason. If he married her, there'd always be a thorn in the side of the high general. For many years, it was assumed you'd have that position. Thorn's getting it anyway, isn't he? Perrin sounded only slightly bothered by that. Kayan's going to be officially installed as high general next week. They're planning a huge ceremony, bigger than the dinner, but he waved that off. There's talk, though, that Cush's death wasn't by heart failure, but that he was slowly poisoned by Kayan. Perrin leaned against the wall. Why doesn't any of that surprise me? Shem gripped his shoulder. Can you see why you're in a very dangerous position right now? They're not just going to let you fade away, Perrin. They're coming after your family. Perrin slumped. So the world really is out to get us, he murmured. How do you know all of this? Because for the past three weeks, I've been in Idumea. Despite his astonishment, Perrin couldn't help but smirk. Really? All by yourself? Shem smirked back. I knew the way this time. What were you doing? Didn't anyone recognize you? There's a great deal to be learned by being a stable hand at the administrator headquarters, Shem winked. Such as what Kay and Thorne's doing to his father-in-law. Everyone in the stables assumed I was merely a man down on my luck cleaning stalls. People say all kinds of things in front of laborers who don't matter. One of the stable boys, who had something going on with one of the mansion's maids, mentioned that she had spied Cain sprinkling something into Cush's soup each week. Oh, Shem, you're brilliant. Perrin grinned in genuine admiration. I should give you my old lieutenant colonel's jacket. You would have been a great officer. Thank you. I often thought so myself, said Shem smugly. Every day, the horses of important visitors came in. You'd be surprised what kind of documents they leave in their saddlebags, assuming the manure men don't know how to read. General Thorne was there more often than he was at the garrison. Every morning, he'd drop off his stallion with ridiculous details about how I should feed it and brush it and speak to it, I think he cares more for his horse than any human being. Then, in the afternoon, he'd come back mumbling and cursing to retrieve his horse. And he never recognized you? Perrin asked, astonished. Cain seen you at least three or four times. He only ever saw my uniform, not me. And never once did he bother to make eye contact with his horse's manure man. Perrin squinted. And why was Cain so upset each day? Because of you and Mari, naturally, Shem told him. We've had a Salemite in the building for several years now. He's the recorder at the main desk to the conference room and told me who went in and out of that room each day. Perrin, the administrator, spent the last two and a half weeks arguing about nothing else but you and Mari. Perrin let out a low whistle. Oh, whatever you do, don't tell her, Shem. She's already a nervous wreck, 
especially after I warned her that Genevieve might be starting a file on her. What's that look for? Shem wet his lips and scrunched his mouth. Oh, no, Perrin said in a low voice. Since when? Remember her first letter to the Department of Instruction asking about letting parents teach their children at home? Her first letter? Perrin blinked in surprise. That was years ago. It didn't make it past the skimmers. Yes, it did, Shem whispered. All the way to Gadaman. He started a file then. Perrin covered his mouth with his hand. It's part of the reason I didn't come earlier. I saw the file on your desk. I mean, the command desk, this afternoon. I think it was supposed to have been hidden under the papers on top of it. But there was a lot of activity in the office. And some of the younger soldiers were a little sloppy around the desk. I think they were trying to put their transfer requests on top of the others. Shem unbuttoned the pouch on the side of his bag and pulled out a thick stack of papers with a thin leather cover. He laid it on the dirt and straw in front of Perrin and opened it to the first page. I'd been waiting for my chance to get to it, but I had to do it when no one would suspect it was me. Lemuel thinks he misplaced this in his quarters. He was tearing it apart tonight, searching. That's why I was finally able to sneak out and come here. Perrin didn't touch the file, but stared at the name and the notes on the front of it, as if it were a poisonous snake, ready to attack the first thing that moved. Shem didn't like touching it either, but he shifted over Gadaman's notes to reveal Mari's first letter, marked with underlines and comments in the margins, written in Gadaman's hand. With a stick, Shem pointed at where Perrin was already staring. Mari paid Oshin, red dot, traitor. Perrin, she's scheduled for trial in three days, and so are you. Now Perrin's other hand covered his mouth too, but he didn't take his eyes off the file. Shem slid over a few more pages, still with the stick, as if the file were infected. Mari's second letter her third, her fourth, everything she said in front of the administrators in Idemia. More notes, more comments, more pages. General Thorne came to the stables in an excellent mood afternoon before last, Shem related quietly. He was actually whistling as he retrieved his horse and whispered lovingly to it. I heard him mention your names. And that's when I knew the administrators had finally come to a decision. And if it was something to make Kayan so happy, it certainly couldn't be good for you. I left immediately, dropping my pitchfork in the middle of the dirty stall and borrowed a horse from my contact to get back here, riding all night and borrowing a few more animals along the way. Late this afternoon, a messenger came for Lemuel. I was in the forward office when he arrived. Thankfully, Lemuel has yet to figure out about those holes in the wall under the banner and map. I heard him discussing the contents of the message with Lieutenant Raiden. Perrin, Administrator Genev is on his way. He'll be here late tomorrow night and will be taking over Rector Young's home and the rectory. He's to escort you, Mari, and even Pato day after tomorrow in the morning to Idemia. You're to ride in separate coaches with four guards for each of you. Perrin, you know as well as I do that there's no chance for a fair trial for any of you. Perrin didn't breathe. He didn't blink. He just stared, motionless, at the death sentence that sat before him, written in his wife's hand, begun several years ago. Shem continued. There was no mention of Jaitsey. Thorne knew she was having pains earlier and was rather anxious about it. He seems to have his own plans for her, Perrin, but I don't know what they are, and I don't want to know either. Perrin remained immobile. Do you see now why we have to get you out tomorrow night? Shem gripped his shoulder again. There's no more time for you. The saver of Edge is now 
the traitor of Idumea, and his wife caused his downfall. You may just be imprisoned at the garrison for the rest of your life, so General Thorne can come gloat at you. But Mari, recently the administrators passed all the laws they need to convict and execute based on someone expressing their ideas. Death for merely words, Perrin. No actions, just thoughts. They don't even need this file. Mari said more than enough about her disbelief in the findings of Tarip's land and in front of far too many witnesses. Finally finding the strength to move, Perrin could do nothing but slowly shake his head. Before we were married for two years, Hogel told me that Mari was the most dangerous woman in the world, he whispered. But she never knew she was dangerous. All she ever did was try to find the truth. That's all she's ever been guilty of, Shem. She's no traitor. Just a little woman in a little village, intent on finding the truth. He stared at the ground, his countenance heavy and dark. We have to destroy that file, Shem, and Mari must never know about it, at least not until we reach Salem. Shem sat up. So you agreed to go? Jothan said he wasn't convinced you were really ready to leave. So his name's Jothan, Perrin said dully, staring at the file and fear flickering in his eyes. Shem, there's nothing in this world that I want anymore. Nothing except to take my family and leave it. Yes, Shem said in a loud whisper. He grabbed Perrin's arms and shook them enthusiastically. He even managed to shake a frail smile onto his friend's face. All right, all right already, Perrin said. I'm doing the right thing, correct? Absolutely. Perrin, you can trust Jothan with anything. He'll get you over and see to it that Jatesy's comfortable. Wait, Perrin interrupted. You're not coming with us? I can't. I have more work to do here. I can't leave yet. Someday I will, but I don't know when. Clearly not happy with that response, Perrin said. Shem, I don't know if I feel good about this now. I was fully expecting you'd take us. I don't go, Perrin. I keep the route clear, but I don't go unless it's on leave. That's another thing I need to confess. On leaves, I never went south to go home. I figured that out by now, Perrin said hurriedly. Shem, I barely know Jothan. But he knows all about you, Perrin scoffed. So he says. Perrin, trust Jothan more than you trusted me. He's the one who got you through your trauma not me. Perrin's skepticism returned once again. What do you mean? I told Mari that I found a book which explained how to help traumatize soldiers. Shem began guiltily. There was no book. That's why, even though she insisted on reading it, I told her she couldn't because it was never to leave the surgeon's office. Another deception. Sorry. She didn't want the surgeon to know what was going on with you, although he figured things out by your behavior. Another thing I failed to tell you about, sorry. There are actually several more things you don't know about yet. I know, I know, keep going. Anyway, there never was a book. Rector Young has helped several traumatized soldiers, but even he depended upon Jothan. Normally, Jothan lives in the forest in a camp he and his wife have set up, Returning to Salem maybe once every four to five weeks, unless he's escorting families. But when you were having your nightmares, Jothan made the journey far more frequently to deliver my concerns to Salem and to find out how to help you next. Usually Jothan and Azrar rotate the escorting duties with two other couples throughout the year. But when their turn for the year was up, they refused to leave. They didn't want to go back to Salem until they knew you were going to make it. They stayed the full year just to keep watch over you. Their last name is Hefati. 
Shem watched Perrin intently to see how much he might pick up from that. Perrin rubbed some dirt on his boot until it was gone, unable to look Shem in the eyes. Jothan and Azra Hifadi. I had no idea, he whispered. I, uh, I wasn't the most friendly to him tonight. In fact, most of the time, I was trying to figure out if I could beat him in a fight. Shem shook his head. Nope. Even at your best, he would have thrown you to the ground like you used to throw me. He smiled. A few times I really wished I could see you two wrestle and see you get humbled. Maybe I still might get my wish. You might have a chance at beating him. He's only two years older than you. Perrin looked up. Seriously? I thought he was a lot younger. Shem grinned. If that doesn't get you, this will. He's a grandfather. That did get him. No! Perrin almost forgot to keep his voice down. Shem laughed quietly. He and Azra are married when they were 18. They had six children in seven years. Now that they're all grown and married, he's devoted his life to helping others reach Salem, like his wife's ancestors. Shem's voice quieted. He's really quite a remarkable man. I have no doubt the two of you will become great friends. He can keep you entertained until it's time for me to return to Salem. And Perrin, this wasn't your first encounter with Jothan. Perrin rubbed his eyes. I don't know how much more I can take. All right, when did I meet him before? Not exactly meet, Shem bobbed his head. It was before my time in Edge. It seems there was a determined captain who knew that twelve garters were coming to take his expecting wife and daughter. Oh, Shem, Perrin breathed. I think I know what this is about. You do, Perrin. There weren't twelve men. There were fourteen. Our scouts counted them as they came into the forest. Salem knew what was coming, and they called out as many volunteers as they could find. Perrin, more than 70 men came to your aid that night. I've read the reports. You took out a few garters right off, but others had slipped past you. So the Salemites caught them and herded them back to you, knowing that you wouldn't leave until you knew all were secured. Some of our men even held and muzzled the last two after you killed the initial twelve. They lost grip on the one who tried to strangle you. Perrin rubbed his throat as if he could still feel it. The man was massive. I took my long knife and thrust it behind me, catching him on the cheek. And also catching Jothan Hefadi on his right hand. He was coming to your rescue and you nicked him as you slashed the garter on the cheek. Jothan still has the scar, and it was Jothan who plunged his knife into your strangler's neck an instant later, and bounded off into the woods so you wouldn't know he'd been there. You did kill the 14th on your own after you were injured. Had you been unable, you would have been helped again. Jothan had also killed a garter who you only injured with an arrow in the thigh but the rest really were yours. Another minute passed in silence as Perrin stared at his hands. Jothan saved my life that night, he said after a while, and also spent another year seeing me through my trauma. Shem, how would I even begin to thank him? By trusting him. When he comes for you tomorrow night, just nod. He'll get the message. He's not a very emotional person. He's much more like you than me, and will be pretty annoyed when he learns how much I've told you about him. Now, I suggest we dispose of these papers properly and get some sleep tonight. You have a journey ahead of you tomorrow night, and my duty shift just changed to the night shift. Neither of us will have had enough rest. As Perrin stood up and wiped the straw off his pants, he said, I always wondered why you took so many night shifts. What else don't I know yet, Shem? Shem smiled guardedly as he got to his feet. 
You've heard enough for one night. Early in the morning, Decket walked into his barn to begin milking. He immediately saw that one of his shovels was in a different place than it was the night before. He normally wouldn't have noticed, but he was sure he had left the shovel leaning against the back door after he'd used it to pointlessly move some dirt back and forth while waiting for his wife to calm down after her frustrating day when she didn't yet become a mother. He was too lazily distracted last night and didn't hang the shovel next to the second one on the pegs on the wall. Yet it was there now. Nervously, he looked around the barn. In the dim morning light, it was hard to tell, but it seemed that in an empty stall, the ground had been disturbed and straw strewn over the top so as to conceal the act. He evaluated the spot for a moment before deciding not to touch it. His father-in-law would be over in a little while. He could investigate it and tell Deck what may have happened. After all, Perrin always knew everything. And that's the end of this chapter and the end of book four, Falcon in the Barn. Whew, we made it through another one, guys. All right. Thank you for hanging in there and hanging in there with me. And the next one is coming up all about Salem. And this is the whole reason I wrote this series is about Salem. This is Zion. This is what we can get. This is what we have to achieve. This is where we're going. We're going to get there sometime and it can be done. It can absolutely be done. And in Salem, I show you how. So, Oh, I need to do my little end credits. Okay, too much enthusiasm. All right, this has been Falcon in the Barn, book four, written by Trish Mercer, read by Trish Mercer, published by Trish Mercer, because no one else wants to do it, just me. Um, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. <laughs> I'll get to working on book five as soon as I can. Today is February 14th, 2023. We'll see when book five starts coming out. Thank you.